are back at a little after 20 after 5. I'm not here by myself. Yonkai is here, but uh, there he is. Oh, okay. I think we're doing the split screen effect oh, here or something. I'm not okay. sure. I'm All not right. sure. <laughs> well, let me just say this. Yes. <laughs> I have to tell you that after seeing that weather forecast, yeah. I have known you now for like 35 years. Yeah. And I never could come up with a suitable nickname for you. Uh-oh. But I have a suitable nickname. You know what it is? Uh, I can't wait. You're Green Alley. <laughs> Gene Alley. Gene Alley. For I mean, the those guy used to you, play for the Pirates, the, the shortstop. The guy who was the utility man for the Pirates. Yeah. He played every position at one time or pitching, another. Yeah. But at one time, he did everything. So you're Gene Alley. Well, so, you, you know, you're doing the weather. Do whatever you have to do. You're doing everything. Do. My <laughs> heavens. I mean, that was <laughs> oh, great. thank you. That was a real treat. Thank you. Um, biggest stories of the year. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You go first because I mean, I I have some locally I want to mention, but I assume we're also going to talk about. You also want to talk about some of the bigger ones nationwide, which I suppose would include some tragic stories, the massacre. And well, up the until election. up until the election, um, and up until the shootings in um, Connecticut, the election was in effect the top story right. of the year. Yeah. Um, but um, the um, shootings in Connecticut really trumped all of the stories um, because it was so sudden it was so near Christmas and it was just so tragic unlike some of the other gun violence that has occurred in this country I mean you know children were killed and yeah. I mean not I mean like little kids and uh, it was just a real tragic thing and I think that uh, that overtook all of the um, all of the uh, other stories of the year along those lines there Marty and I didn't get to mention this we ran out of time yesterday there were two college basketball teams who are trying to do something to honor the memory of those kids Virginia Tech right. is mm -hmm. replacing its logo with uh, an exact replica of the one that the Sandy Hook Elementary School uses. And Xavier mm -hmm. actually had larger replica uniforms made for their players like the uh, elementary kids wore at uh, Sandy Hook. So, right. I mean, you, you can be cynical and say, well, that doesn't really do anything. Well, maybe not, but it is a sign of respect and it attempted a sign of empathy. And I think both schools are being uh, to, to, uh, to be congratulated for doing that. And for modern day athletes, too, it's a uh, regular recognition that they have a social uh, awareness of what's going on. Yeah. For years, you and I have railed about the fact that so many baseball players had no idea who Jackie Robinson was. Yeah. And it's always good to see that, you know, um, players and college age players and coaches are embracing exactly socially what has happened. Yeah. 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 So we're around the same page, on. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no big difference there. I, 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 have a, I have a national story for you, right? All right. Do you think this is a national story or not? The reemergence of Bill Clinton as a political power. No, I. Well, it's a national story, but I don't think it's it's a big surprise. Right. Mm -hmm. um, he, when you look at his term, it's kind of odd. Uh, I don't think he got over fifty percent of the vote in Never. either election. Never. Uh, so he was a plurality president for eight years. Even those of us who didn't vote for him, either time have to look back at his term and say well he did a fairly decent job so he has a pretty good record he could stand on clinton loved the limelight that was obvious and the more you and learned he, about his term when he was governor in arkansas he even loved it then even though the rest of us didn't really see it except for his role as the i guess he was the chairman of the dlc the democratic uh, leadership council Demo for a while the democratic leadership which was council. sort of like the centrist group of democrats right. at that time uh but no i, I it's a story yeah but it, it's it's, it's not a big surprise to me. The Democratic Leadership Council is a perfect example of someone creating an opportunity because after the Dukakis um, loss in 1988, one thing that the Democrats found was that they lost, Bush I think had 414 electoral votes yeah, in that election. Was, yeah, but the popular vote was a lot closer. Though. Right, right. And how they lost was that they lost Pennsylvania by 30,000. Right. They lost Ohio by 25,000. So they didn't lose in the big state by a lot. And Clinton saw that as an opportunity for him to, you know, um, work on this um, uh, Democratic Leadership Council. And when a lot of the people who were uh, people who were uh, known as uh, great contenders, if you will, didn't jump in. Mario Cuomo comes to mind in 1992. Clinton was the one who actually went in and he secured the nomination. Well, Cl Cuomo certainly wouldn't have fit the profile of the no, DLC because Cuomo was pretty far to the left of center. One guy I'm thinking of who was uh, 
deposed as House Speaker here in Pennsylvania. Bob O'Donnell was, I think, the biggest name Democrat uh, who fit, uh, who joined DLC and became uh, one of their underling executives or right. whatever. And he fit the profile because O'Donnell really was pretty centrist. Right, right. And, and so what happened to the Democrat Party since then? That centrism is long gone. The press loves to beat up the Republicans for being too far right. The Democrats are so far left that I don't see much of a difference on individual policy planks between it and the Socialist Workers Party. Oh, come no on. No question oh, about no, that. Socialist Workers, let me tell you this. Okay, under... get the last word, then we have to break. Under the last four years, there have been more millionaires created under the Obama administration. A lot of that with government socialists. money. Everybody involved in Solyndra, for example. Oh, come is, on. Which is a money laundering scheme. It we'll is break. not. We'll be back. Heavens, here we go it's again. The Friday on my mind edition of Topic Hey on YLN. Stay here. Five thirty-two, and we're back with the Friday on My Mind edition of Topic A, Yonkai Tyrone. Um, there are a lot of stories that happen around in in our viewing area uh, with some significance. A couple of them are the very tragic stories. Four fatal hit and runs in this area. Yeah. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Four of them. Yeah. This um, year alone. Yeah, this year, yes. Yeah. That's three of them in Wilkes-Barre and then the one in, uh, on, in, in front of the McDonald's on Pittston on 315. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we also had the Tyler Winstead situation, uh, which I frankly think was exploited by some people, uh, but uh, it, to try to inflame tensions, there were calls for marches on City Hall and all that kind of nonsense. And of course, well, it turned out to be an accident. And that's what a lot of people speculated. I, among them from the beginning, right. the because of some of the physical aspects of the way the kid was found and all that. And of course now his, that his friend's mother is facing charges. Right, well that whole story when it was actually coming out, it did a little bit of danger to people who were actually afraid because there was the red Taurus yes. that supposedly was there. And anytime you have a person who fabricates a story and then that story is actually enhanced or bolstered by an adult, then it really put a panic to a lot of oh, people. Oh, no the question city about it, but I still think that the city police mm -hmm. and the DA's office, and overall, 70 Salavanas, I think, has done a pretty decent job as district attorney, but in this case, I wish they would have said something beforehand, be, shortly after it happened, because there was public panic. I mean, we were talking to people in the high right. two weeks later well, who yeah. were still afraid. At least come out say, look, we don't believe, we are not looking for this red Taurus, we don't believe that part of the story. Just let it go with that. Some kind of statement to at least alleviate public fear, and nobody did that. But I think by the weekend after it happened and after the funeral, there was speculation that was leaked to the press. Was it wasn't speculation, official. There was speculation, Dave, but I but think it wasn't we needed an official, an official word yeah. from somebody, mm -hmm. public, calm down. You're not in danger. There's no lunatic running around with a gun. Just at least say that. Right. And they yeah. didn't, That I think they should have. Yeah, and that trial is going to be in January of 2013. Yes. That's yes. going to be pretty interesting, whether she's going to plea or whether she's going to have a trial, and just see how that's going to play out. Well, she was originally going to plea. Right. And then when she found out that there would be jail time associated, she withdrew the plea and decided to go to a court. I know her attorney for quite a long time. Tom Marcilio. Yeah, and he was urging her to take the plea, and so... All right, we'll uh, break because I made a mess of the format clock. When we come back, I'm going to tell you what I think the biggest story of the year was, and it's kind of boring, but it's impli it's locally. And at, it's kind of boring, but it's got a lot of implications to it. I have one thing to say. At our age, boring is good. You uh, don't want any type of excitement. Not at all. All right, we'll break. We'll be back. Topic A on YLN. We are back. All right. An accounting firm goes bankrupt. Who cares? Right. A tax collector. Who cares? Sentax, a.k.a. the Don Wilkinson Agency, goes bankrupt because there's a cash flow problem with the county, virtually bankrupts the county's two biggest cities, Wilkes-Barre and Hazel. Right. Because they're both owed over a million dollars from Sentax. So here's a boring story that nobody really noticed that we're looking at. I mean, uh, we're in Wilkes-Barre right now. We're a, a budget with a significant tax hike is coming. Hazelton City Council passed one last night after the mayor had proposed an even bigger one. And if he vetoes the budget that they passed last night, you've got a big stalemate where the city will basically shut down and this is because of a firm that went bankrupt. And Wilkes-Barre yesterday passed a 26% tax increase on property taxes. This is going to have long-ranging ramifications and this points to something that I've always said about local government. 
you know, you can't, it's almost like the Russian um, Reagan thing where he said with uh, Gorbachev, trust but verify. Yeah. You know, I really think that a lot of these um, organizations that have been bedrocks, they, they need to be watched a little bit further because, again, this is going to have long range um, ramifications for like a very long time. It will. Unless they come up with a bona fide. Um, replacement. And this is going to give impetus to the tax collectors who basically have been under fire by the county government. Why do we need tax collectors? Well, how could they do any worse than what Dan Wilkerson did? Yeah, well, that's, that, that's exactly the point. And I blame the Commonwealth for this more than anybody else. Right, Specifically, that legislation, the General Assembly, yeah. with, I think it's Act 32 that appointed one tax collector, Act 32 of 2008 or 2009, right. whatever it was, that appointed one tax collector per county. As we said on this program before, if you're a little Montour County or Elk or Clearfield, maybe, but when you're talking at a bigger one, like a Lehigh or a Luzerne or a Lackawanna, Luzerne, you got 92 different taxing entities mm -hmm. between school districts and municipalities in the county. One firm is going to keep all that straight and be able to collect all that revenue and distribute it. It looked like it was impossible when the when the uh, legislation passed. Obviously, we saw it was impossible. And one of the things that bothered me about that legislation is whatever happened to competitive, competitive bidding? Why did they put that out so that by law, not by fiat or not by political cronyism, but by law, you could only have one tax collection agency. That really um, tied the hands of the local municipalities. Certainly did. Because what if there was somebody like uh, Tom Layton uh, involved in the real estate business for a long time? I mean, I'm sure that he had other uh, contacts that you know could have maybe done a better job yeah. had they gone out there and bid for it yeah, instead and, of and having and one person by law. The uh, the the uh, supporters at that time said this was a way to streamline government. What it was an idea to do was to try to centralize everything, right. and it turned out to be an absolute disaster. And there's a difference between streamlining and centralizing power. And unfortunately, the General Assembly at that time and the governor at that time, Ed Rendell, didn't know the difference. We've got more stuff to talk about. We'll do it in a second. Let's take it. A I a little pressed on time. Those are the stories that I think were the biggest ones locally. You get tossed in some other ones. Min's second downtown Hazleton closing. That closing, was a big yeah, deal. Yeah. Uh, the Sterling saga continuing and right. with, with no apparent end in sight. So. Right. The inauguration of the new county government, yeah. a, 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 a placeholder county manager, uh, Tom Prabula, and then after Prabula, uh, after eight weeks, the hiring of a new permanent manager, Bob right. Lawton, and then the inauguration of the new council, seeing how the new council is governing, seeing how they're working, um, you know, it's been a really interesting um, uh, aspect to watch uh, in this year for 2013 with the county. Well, one thing that has made covering county council very difficult, Ooh. the meetings all last four and a half hours. I mean, you send somebody to a county council meeting and say, pretty much I'll see you tomorrow morning, and right. they're going to make it back for 10 o'clock. One night, I, I decided that I was going to watch them. And I started at like nine, and I thought that I had already missed it. And by 11 o'clock, they were still doing more work. Yeah. And that gives you an example of a lot of these county council members that actually ran. They're really being very dedicated by showing up and doing the work that they need to do. And I'm wondering how many people are going to be running for another term after this their, year, after their two years or four years, because it's going to be very interesting to see because it is a big workload. We've well, we got five seats open this year, right? I believe it's six. I, I believe you're going to have the bottom six, the bottom six. finishers who actually had two-year terms. Because they only want two-year terms, the right. The top seven. And that's so that it's yeah. staggered. You don't re-elect it. Once everything gets up and running, that you don't have the entire council up for election each time. Well, you have 13, right? You have seven and six, right? Yeah, right. Okay, so then you have, uh, yeah, you're going to have the bottom six. Bottom six, all right. So the primary season probably won't be as, as it's not going to be as crowded as it was two years ago. Don't count on that. You, well, you, you, yeah, you never maybe, know. Because right. this is politics in Luzerne County. And but you know, I, what I was hoping was, I, you knew the meetings were going to take a long time right. in the beginning because they had a lot of things to set, a lot of things to redo, things they wanted to change from the old commission form of government. I figured they'd be at a normal school board length right. by August. 
September. They've actually gotten longer. <laughs> right, right. And and it's amazing, too, because you see the usual suspects, which, I mean, I think the people who come to public meetings, I salute them. But like every other month, you see the same people yeah. making sometimes That's the everywhere. same points. Yeah. If, if, if you're a regular at any city council meeting mm -hmm. or any school board meeting, you probably see some of the same people who come uh, every month. And it's generational because when I was uh, starting out in the media years ago, uh, there were two um, guys in Wilkesbury, Ambrose Maletsky. I knew. You remember Ambrose? Yes. Yeah. And I mean, he would show up, and there was he another, died um, a couple of years yeah, ago. I said maybe a couple two of years, or three ago, years yeah. ago. And there was he was coming to the original county count, the first um, government study. The government study commission. The yeah, first definitely, charter yeah. together. He he come and he spoke almost yeah. every week. Yeah, you have to respect guys like that because yep. they are relentless in their pursuit of uh, what they feel is uh, good government. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. So we got uh, about the a minute left, not enough time to uh, get into all that much. So let me ask you jokingly, have you seen the uh, Piers Morgan deportation petitions? Uh, they've got, uh, last I saw, it was close to 100,000 signatures and anything over 40,000 the White House has to deal with in one way or another. You mean they want to deport him? They want to deport him because of his stance on gun control. Uh, he agrees with you. You know. But then there was another petition in the, in, uh, in the United Kingdom that says, no, we don't want him. Keep him. <laughs> You know, well, I mean, you know, he's not wanted by both countries. That's a big distinction. But, you know, it's amazing to me that we want freedom of speech only for the people that we well, agree with. Oh, Would they do that to Rush Limbaugh? Well, he's an American oh, to begin with. No, but they're... Well, what about Rush Limbaugh's birth certificate? I want to see that. Well, Where was certainly during the Sandra Fluke thing, there were organized yeah. efforts to get him off at WILK. We got something like 150,000 emails I'm, from organized groups groups to get the right. guy off the air. And of course, they were all met by hit, delete, hit, delete, hit, right. delete. Right. Mm -hmm. But so you're right in that we are very hypocritical when it comes to the First Amendment. We want it for ourselves, not for the other guy. And that's both sides, yeah. both political camps. I, like I'm that. not a big Pierce Morgan fan. You know, I kind of miss that. Many people uh, aren't that uh, yeah, the ratings are real bad. I, I, I kind of miss like, you know, Cleveland, you're on. Go ahead. Right. Larry King. All right, we'll break. We'll come back and uh, last look at the forecast and wrap up for the night. Stay here and stop again on YLA. We got about a minute and ten seconds. Nineteen degrees. That's winter death. You know what? I feel like a little Voltaire because you've been talking about earnest in earnest. Well, the importance of being in earnest. You know yeah. what I mean? But anyway, listen. I just want to wish you a happy. <laughs> I thought you were going year. somewhere with that. I, I, I just wanted to just do a toast. We have Joan Soda here that I brought in. It's not freshly. alcoholic, folks. It's not alcoholic. So call the FCC. May you and the station have a good, great, profitable year. May you keep on doing what you do every single day day here with, with one of the best newscasts. Thank and you. thank you very much for inviting me up. It's a real pleasure. Thank you. Salute and everybody. You're staying, as far as I know, as unless you're changing your mind. No, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Let me tell you, it's a real honor to be here and uh, talking to you every Friday. You know? All right. That so. will do it. Coming up tonight, a late edition at 10 o'clock. Anne is in uh, Wilkes-Barre City Council. We'll have the details as to what happened with the uh, budget there. And Gary Perna has that dispute about the borderline between Sugarloaf Township and Holland back township and lots more tonight at 10 see you then